now seven o'clock what i'll do is um welcome everybody welcome lyle welcome john and david thank you very much for being part of the co-hosting program what i'd like to do is very very quickly david if you could just say a few words and then um, i'll go into the introduction of the speaker thank you david very good thank you so much greg and it's a pleasure to be with everyone thank you to everyone that's joining our webinar tonight here at family voice australia on the media the role of christians to shape the media i was thinking earlier today that as christian people we have a great privilege and responsibility to impact the media and in doing that we impact the culture of course as salt and light so as the agent of influence and power the media really is claimed by christ and we need to recognize his lordship over the media every power and authority is claimed by him according to colossians chapter one he sustains everything by his powerful word he sustains the media by his powerful word even though the media is largely in denial of the claims of Christ. Well, as God's people, we've got to get our thinking straight before we can expect the media to come to the party as well. So I'm very pleased that tonight we can explore that possibility. Of course, it's not only in scripture, it's in our history. We think of the reformers who immediately harnessed this emerging technology of movable type printing, Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, this enabled the mass circulation of scripture and all manner of Christian literature. And it's a great pity, I think, that when more modern technologies came along, particularly television, some extent radio, but particularly television, Christians were not willing to take up the great gospel opportunity and we left the field, so to speak, and we left it to secular forces. Um, and that's a great pity. And then we think about the noble value of journalism the work of the journalist to expose truth. So many good things have come out of newspaper inquiries or television inquiries, documentaries into uh, alleged injustice. Uh, and that's been really fantastic. So uh, there's a strong opportunity for us uh, to encourage young Christian people, especially to go into the media, into journalism, into filmmaking, into the theater, uh, into the internet so that we can regain this lost territory and harness it. And though, though we've lost so much ground, uh, nevertheless, thankfully, the internet is still wide open. And certainly in the free countries, uh, with the notable exception of China and perhaps North Korea, um, largely there, there's a, a tremendous opportunity, although uh, the freedom of expression is being uh, cracked down upon in the West as well, but uh, largely the internet is pretty much unstoppable and so we have a, a tremendous opportunity uh, let me just conclude my opening remarks with two key quotations one from benjamin franklin who said whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing the freedom of speech but certainly at family voice we stand very much for freedom of speech and the other quotation from ted bear uh, who said he who controls the media controls the culture very powerful statement. So I think as God's people, we really need to grasp this ministry opportunity. So let's commit the evening to God in prayer as we bring these thoughts to him. Our Father, we thank you for all of your gifts, including technology, the creativity that you give as a common grace to all mankind. Help us to harness these opportunities that we create through uh, the use of technology, the mass media, the internet, radio, television, uh, the print medium, uh, and all these, all these things, Lord, we bring them to you and ask that you will forgive us for having let slip so much territory. We want to regain that territory, so help us. And we thank you that in this latest development of technology, which is the internet, that uh, largely it's unfettered and largely we have a wide open opportunity. So help us to grasp it with both hands in the name of Christ, that we may minister your wisdom, your word, your gospel as salt and light, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Everybody, hope you can all see that. What we've got there is uh, the main 
slide. Uh, we have, of course, our two speakers for tonight, Lyle Mercer and John Sanderman from Eternity. So um, I really do appreciate, gentlemen, for coming on board. What I'd like to do is just to make sure that everything's working. I'm going to play a short video, so I'm hoping this is all going to uh, uh, go to plan, but let me know if it doesn't. Mercer PR is considered the leading public relations company in Australia for Christian churches, organisations and schools. We've worked beside many Christian leaders across all denominations to deal with issues when they arise. So we had two High Court challenges, so they were very high profile. Our whole funding model was at risk. What Mercer PR did was help us turn a story that began as Chaplaincy is Dead, and by the end of that news cycle on day one, the story had become you know, hollow victory for opponents of Chaplaincy. It was just invaluable having Lyle in my corner. As the newly appointed head of Christian SRE, my role was to engage with the media. That's something I hadn't done before. Mercer PR were amazingly helpful in helping me to work out what I should say what my core messages were and what would be helpful to the ministry into the future and be able to help special religious education nationally. I think it's very important to have somebody helping you in PR who gets you. Mercer PR working with many Christian organisations means they come from a perspective of understanding who you are and what your values are and I think one of the things that you need to project in any story is who you are and what are your values. We specialise in reputation and issues management, corporate communications and crisis communications, including crisis planning. So I encourage you to give me a call and we can have a talk about how we can help your organisation. I was looking at some data live very recently that said Australia is still 51% of the population identifies Christians. Yet this, this does not mean that the media treat Christianity always accurately or fairly. Why is that so? Over to you, Mark. Well, that's a really good question. And uh, I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer that through the night, if that's all right, through yep. this next few minutes. Um, but you're right. One of the things that, that is absolute fact is that way more people uh, either support Christian values or faith values than what people might like to make out. And we've done similar type of surveys. In fact, uh, we did a survey we through McCrindle, who everyone would know, McCrindle organisation, uh, over the last couple of years for different organisations. And, and time and time again, we see that, and those figures, that 51 might be an official figure, but the, the surveys I've seen are far more people than that even if they, if they don't subscribe to a faith belief, uh, believe in the values behind that and support the values behind that. So everything we talk about, it's very important to realise that mainstream Australia, as we've seen over and over again, uh, is, is different from what, we, what the media like to perceive to be, um, to be the facts. And uh, so it's a good question. David, I really like what you had to say too before about... Um, uh, or you're quoting someone I know, but uh, it was a good point that it's not about just influencing the media, it's about influencing culture. And that's what it's about. And we've seen over the last few years, we've seen culture change in Australia and culture change around the world. And we've seen it because of people's voices and, and the media. Uh, and it's important to remember that when you, there's a lot of activists out there, of course, these days, whether they're coordinated or they just jump on the bandwagon, and activists have this have this voice. They don't represent the mainstream, but they they know how to speak. They know how to make their voice sound a lot louder than what it was, uh, what it is. And uh, so, and politicians, sadly, they get roped in by this. They look at people's voices. They look at social media, and they look at Twitter, and they think, oh, that's that's what Australia thinks. No, it's not what Australia thinks at all. It's what a small minority of Australians think, and they have a voice. And uh, I think one of the points that David was making before, and I totally agree with this, that over the last number of years, uh, the, the church, church's voice has been silent on, on many, many, many issues. Um, there's, some, there's some valid reasons for that. They get attacked and they get abused, and, but I can understand that. Um, but of course, the result of that is that the voices we're hearing are the voices that are opposed to what Christians believe in. 
So, so we, we deal a lot in this area with, we deal with Christian organizations, but predominantly in the space between them and the mainstream media. Um, and the motivation, or what I'm wanting to, I guess, share tonight a little bit uh, is based on what Greg, you've said, and the motivation for this webinar is that Christian organizations, from what I've heard and what they tell me and what I've, I've seen, they find it difficult to get traction from the media. Uh, when they want to get their message out. And they're also concerned about being attacked and misrepresented. And there's, and there's a re reason for that, because they are attacked and they are misrepresented in the media. But, and they see the media as anti-Christian and often very pro any subject that is contrary to what many Christians believe. And it is, that's, that's the facts. Um, so tonight, I just wanna, I guess, this is going to be very introductory. Obviously, you know, a lot of the times we, we share with people, it's, it, it's, it's more in depth, but we don't have the really time tonight, 15, 20 minutes. But I want to help you gain a better understanding of this media world and how to navigate the media world, because it is vital for the Christian voice to be heard. And uh, I'm not sure who's on the webinar tonight, but whoever you are, I know you represent Christian organisations. Uh, you've got individual voices and you've got a collective voice for your organisation as well. Um, and so, of course, where there's a multitude of beliefs across Christianity as well, of course, but I'm talking about evangelical Christians who, who believe what the Bible says uh, and believe in the traditional teachings. There's two different, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go to my PowerPoint, if that's all right. I'm just going to share the screen here so I can, um, so we can, people can follow along there. Um, I'm assuming you can see that. Um, let me just uh, click on that, make sure I'm, there we go, good stuff. So, um, there's two different objectives here. There's an objective of the faith organizations and an objective of the media. As a Christian, as a Christian ministry, uh, you have a message. And your objective is to get that message to your marketplace or to the people you wanna hear that message. The media has a very different objective. What they simply wanna do is tell a story, that's it. A lot of the times, the media and particular journalists, they're not necessarily anti-Christian, but they see controversy as the only way to tell a good story. Uh, not every journalist is as balanced as John at Eternity and actually has a, uh, you know, looks at the, at the facts. Uh, unfortunately, facts uh, get in the way of a lot of stories because the story that the journalist wants to tell, uh, they can create, they can make any facts line up with the story they want and that's what happens so um their objective is simply to tell a story and it's essential for every christian and christian ministry to understand this because it will save them a lot of frustration because over and over again i hear why doesn't the media you know take our stories why are they not interested in what we want to say but it's also vital for people to understand how we communicate now. See, we communicate differently to what we've ever communicated before. Social media has changed the goalposts. It's changed everything. It's given everyone a forum. Video is a huge thing now. I mean, people, uh, you know, video is what is, is what makes the world go around. We, there's a, a lot of news at the moment about TikTok, the Chinese-owned uh, social media platform. It's all based on video. And so that's, uh, we have a shorter attention span. We're teaching <laughs> kids to, to talk in 180 characters or 240 characters now. Uh, we're teaching them to, to um, uh, look at short span videos. My son said to me the other day that he's got friends uh, and he's, um, he's 17. I had to think about that for a second. Um, he, he's, uh, he said to me, he's got friends who literally can't watch a movie now because they get so bored 20 minutes into the movie, they're bored because they're so used to bang, bang, YouTube, all these videos. And uh, that's, that's how people are communicating. It's not right, but it's, it's how it is. Clickbait headlines. You see that all the time. You, you click on it and it's got nothing to do with the story. People share now. They share everything. They share content. They share video. They share pictures of their food. Um, you know, as if they think that people are interested in their steak and chips at the local pub. They, they, they feel obligated to share it. Uh, but the other thing they share is they share, you know, anything. They share if, if two people are in a fight. Instead of intervening in the fight, they'll take a video and share it. That's the world we're living in. So the mainstream media, though, has also changed. So we have to understand, before we can talk about the media, 
and communication. And tonight is about communication. It's about let's communicate our message, our voice to the marketplace. That's what it's about. So if you want to replace the word media with communication, because media now has a much broader meaning to what it ever had before. Media doesn't, doesn't mean Channel 7 News at nights anymore. There's so much more than that. So we have to understand that the media has changed as well. The media now, of course, has to be politically correct. Uh, not all the media, but a lot of it. And they're focused on the, everything they write is politically correct. The media have agendas. Um, they absolutely have agendas. I mean, journalists go on social media and give their opinions, and then they write stories about it. Uh, I remember a journalist uh, a number of years ago who wrote a story about uh, uh, such an anti-Christian story. She called them, I think it was like believing in the fairies at the, at the end of the garden, I think she wrote. And then after that opinion piece, a week later, she phoned a Christian ministry and said, oh, look, I'm doing a news story about this news subject. Could, could I please have some comments? And I spoke to the editor of the paper at the time and I said, look, there's no way in the world that this journalist, who is an opinion editor, who's just written this, this piece, is going to ever write an objective article about uh, this, this ministry, this situation. But unfortunately, that's where, the, that's where it's in. The, the, the normal has changed. What the church traditionally believes in is no longer the so-called normal, because culture has changed. The social environment has changed. And, and what is really, uh, I think, the, what, what is really detrimental at the moment is that some of the media, not all of the media, but some sections of the media, it's almost unacceptable to believe what Christians believe. It's not just, uh, they don't, it's not just they disagree, that it's unacceptable. It's almost like people are not allowed to, to, to have a faith belief. And that's the environment we're in. So, so how do Christian organisations, how do, against this backdrop, um, how do Christian ministries communicate? How do we use the media? How do we get that message out? So let's go objectives. And let's talk about the way the media thinks, because we have to understand that. Uh, the media is there yeah. to, to supposedly to educate, inform, and entertain. Well, these days, unfortunately, entertainment has, has probably overridden a lot of the other two. Uh, you see a lot of very, uh, very superficial stories, very light stories these days. But amongst all that, there are still good stories, there's still good journalists, and there's still, uh, still in-depth, proper, hard news stories that people should know about. So the media is still entertaining, they're, they're still informing, they're still educating. But when we go to the media with our message, whoever we are as a Christian, we have to understand that the media is not there to do a PR job for us. They're not there to push our cause. Uh, the media is there really to, to create a story for themselves, which is supposedly entertaining to their, their readers or their viewers. Um, the media will almost always take a, uh, a devil's advocate approach. They thrive on conflict. Conflict is the story. So if you're wondering why do they not, why are they not interested in my good news story, we're doing some good things here. It's because there's no conflict in the story. And the media love to conflict, because conflict sells. Conflicts make people click. And uh, so that's the reason why they often ignore powerful, good stories, and they go for the stories with conflict. The media's approach can also be coloured by recent happenings, and we've seen that. I mean, we're seeing it with the whole racism issue now, the Black Lives Matter issue. We're seeing a different type of journalism. We're seeing different types of stories being written through COVID that change things. So we have to understand that as well. Um, also, we, we do have to take into consideration when we're dealing with the media and we're trying to talk to them about what we're doing, the journalists are quite clueless about the church and Christianity. Many are. They have no idea. I've, um, I've, I've taken many journalists into a church setting, into a modern, uh, uh, modern charismatic style uh, you know, church setting, and they're, they're literally blown away. And, and they say to me, we've never seen anything like this uh, because there's, they have no experience of church. And if they do, it's usually something as a child going into a, into a more traditional type of church environment. So uh, we have to understand when we're talking to them, they, they don't know. We're talking about faith ideals and faith objectives, and they're filtering them 
through a, a very secular, uh, uneducated, unchurched type of, uh, type of filter. So we have to take that into consideration. And the other thing we have to know about the media, of course, is, is it's there to get a story and good news just doesn't sell a lot of the time. Negativity sells, sells scandal sells. If you look at, the, at the, what's getting the most uh, comments under a news piece, it's usually the pieces that are it's somewhat controversial. That's, uh, and that's, that's with all, all media. So the news fits into, ver into several categories. So what I'm trying to do just, uh, Greg and, and everyone at the moment, is just to try and help us understand the way the media thinks because we can't relate to the media. We can't connect with them until we understand what they're looking for. And they're looking for certain types of stories. And here's a few of the categories. I mean, there's probably a few more than this, but uh, they're looking for stories about celebrities, rich and famous people. Um, accidents and disasters, that's very important, very important. We need to know about those things. We need to know when things happen. The media plays a very important role in those types of situations. We saw it, of course, through the bushfire, and we saw some wonderful reporting and journalism through the bushfire. Uh, new discoveries, products and statistics. These are things that the church can get hold of and ministries can get hold of. If there's statistics, if there's information, the media likes those sort of things. Um, the heroic, conflict, we've gone over that. Children and animals. And of course, the oddball, the outrageous and the bizarre, let's hope that uh, not too many ministries get into that category. Um, so whether you approve of, of the media or not, or the way it does its job, it's, it's still the way people get their news. Even on social media, it's still the, the biggest um, distributor of news through social media are still your mainstream media companies. It's still the same companies, they just do it a different way. And of course, there's a lot of other new companies now too, of course, not just traditional ones as well. So. So what about Christian ministries? How do we handle this? It's, uh, it's a difficult, uh, it's, it's almost like walking a tightrope. You want to get your message out and you, you want them to be interested, but at the same time, you don't want to be a target to the, uh, the attacks. The key is, is to have a strategy. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit of my background, of course, my, even though I was a journalist once upon a time, but uh, public relations is, is, is my, my field these days. And you have to have a plan. So when I say public relations, don't panic, don't be scared. Uh, we have to be prepared. Whether you're a, an individual person who simply just says, I want a voice, or whether you represent a ministry who needs a voice, who wants a voice. The key is to have a plan, have a strategy. That's the key for everything. The church has been caught off guard for a long time. I truly believe that the same-sex marriage debate got through much, much easier than it could have, because for many years, the church has stopped talking about it. And I know they stopped talking about it. I dealt with many of them. And they, they, they said to me, they said, we don't want to say anything because we're too scared. We'll get attacked on social media. And so the only people talking about it were a few organizations, maybe like Family Voice and some of the other more political lobby organizations. But the church is much larger than that. Uh, and, if, and, and the church stopped talking about it. And of course, what happens when there's a void? It means that other voices come into that void and other voices uh, take it on. So remember, if we're not talking, other people are talking. People will hear the voice, they'll hear the messages. If they're not hearing from us, they'll hear from all the people who are against Christianity. And uh, that, of course, I believe, you know, helped, helped things like legislation like that get through. We have to recognize the climate and where Christians and organizations are vulnerable. We have to have a plan in place. So if you represent an organization, be aware of that. Sure, we have to talk, but we have to do it with wisdom. We have to, we have to know that we will be attacked. We will be, uh, you know, we will might be a target on social media. We might get a call from a journalist as well. So with that in mind, if we're going to talk, we also have to be ready to defend our position. And that's important. Um, and in order to defend the position, we have to block out the noise. We have to realize that all that chatter out there on social media does not represent the mainstream of Australia. Now, the challenge is sometimes that little voice becomes a big voice because it gets the support of politicians and it gets the support of the media. But that doesn't mean we, we backtrack. It means we keep talking and we keep talking about what we want to talk about and our message. And a lot of the craziness, and I see some craziness on, on, on social media about Christianity, and it's gotten worse since Scott Morrison has become the Prime Minister. So because we now have an open evangelical Prime Minister, the, the media and, and 
attacks Christianity more and social media attacks it more. And I can tell you, it's ridiculous stuff, ridiculous, crazy stuff, but it's all, it's all aimed, it's all political based basically. Because, I mean, if, if, uh, if, if we didn't have a Christian prime minister or such an openly evangelical prime minister, it might be a little bit different. But don't allow those people to define your message. Don't allow them to define your approach. We have to still keep talking. We have to still keep communicating, but make sense, make sense. Um, so when we talk about it, just mount an argument, talk about what we want to talk about, be ready to defend it. And if someone attacks you, just make sense. Because when you're talking to the mainstream, the mainstream will understand. So we have to aim at them and not talk to the extremes. An example of that is the Israel Folau issue. Now, the amount of money was raised was unprecedented within, within 48 hours. Never seen anything like it. No one has. That didn't all come from Christians. That came from people who simply said, look, we may not agree with what he said, but we certainly believe he has the right to say it. And we believe he has the right to think it. Um, and that's, why, that's where a lot of that money came from. So uh, we have to understand that, that, that when we talk, there will be attacks, there will be criticism, but we still have to stand up. Now we don't say stupid things, but if we're talking sensibly and we're talking rationally, we can defend that position. So my other uh, couple of things before I finish, embrace public relations. Um, yeah, you might think, well, that's a silly, well, we, we don't, you know, we don't do PR, but I guess the question I would ask is what, what do you think public relations is? If I asked you, what do you think public relations is? What is PR? I reckon I'd get a lot of different answers. Some would say, well, it's just spin, isn't it? Well, I think spin went out the door a long time ago. Um, the, uh, the internet really and social media keeps, uh, keeps the spin off, the, off a lot, takes the spin away from PR. I think you can't get away with things like you used to. Uh, not that I ever did, of course, try to get away with things, but, uh, but you can't anymore because you've, you found out. But I'll tell you what PR is. It's very, very simple. Public relations is having a relationship with your publics. Now, publics, another word for publics is your stakeholders, your market, your audience, those you, who you want to hear your message, those you want to reach. Having a relationship with them is public relations. We all do it. Every organisation does it. Every ministry does it. So I'd encourage you to embrace that. So how do we communicate our message more effectively to our publics? How do we get people to hear what we want to say? The first thing you need to do is know, know who they are. Define who do we want to hear this message not everyone is your, is your public. Not everyone is your, um, is, is your market. So PR is simply about our message. What is it? Who do we want to hear it? How do we get it to our publics clearly? And how do we ensure it's not misrepresented? And, and here's the wonderful thing, and David spoke about this earlier. The internet online means we don't have to rely on mainstream media alone anymore. In fact, sometimes, as we've seen with uh, the current president of the United States, the mainstream media is pretty well uh, has a, has a very uh, a firm opinion against him. He still seems to gets his message out through social media. And in fact, his predecessor Barack Obama did the same thing. He didn't even do doorstops coming up to his election. They went to social media. Uh, I was dealing with an organisation a little while back, and we worked out that if they wanted to get a message out, they knew enough people and enough support had enough supporters that within half an hour, if if their supporters rallied and agreed with this we could get a message to 70,000 people across social media. Now that's, that's phenomenal and, and, I, and your ministry might be the same. Uh, so don't just limit yourself to mainstream. Take your own videos, get it out on social media. Use the Christian media. We've got some, we've got some not a lot of Christian media in Australia, but we've got some good ones. Eternity, and I know I'm, I'm, John's listening in and I'm not just saying this for his benefit, but Eternity is a, is a really top quality. Uh, news publication. I can tell you, it's it's uh, for a Christian publication. It's it's up there with any as good as good as you'll ever see. So send them your information. Talk to them. Tell them what you're doing. They may not run the story like any other organisation, but at least they'll listen. Um, we've got some really good radio stations uh, in Australia and uh, Christian radio stations. So maybe that's a medium as well. So let me just quickly say this: PR is about building trust. Trust overrides sensationalism. As a Christian, as a Christian ministry, 
our goal is for people to trust us, to trust what we have to say, our supporters and other people as well. Now, if people trust you, they'll believe you over those who say other things about you. So if you say something, it's, and it's particularly important to have a healthy trust bank, I call it the trust bank balance, balance so that in times of adversity, you can make withdrawals. So if someone's attacking you and you say, no, 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 here's what we mean, here's what we're saying, and we believe in this, what you want is people to go, yeah, okay, we trust you, we accept what you're saying. And the reason we trust you is because you've built up that trust with us over time, because we've heard what you say. You, you make sense. So the way to build up a trust bank is to define your message, communicate regularly, communicate regularly. If the only time people hear about you is when it's negative, then that's the perception they'll have. If the only time people hear about you is what someone else says about you, that's the perception they'll have. But if you're communicating regularly, they will listen to you. So it's about controlling the message. Um, I'm a big uh, rugby league fan and I know that the, the team that controls the play and controls the ball usually wins the game. And it's the same with communication. The, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. If you control the message, you will usually win the game. And your organisation, every Christian organisation has a great message. But if you don't own the narrative about what you stand for, and what you believe, someone else will own that narrative. Um, the final thing I'll say is we are one dumb comment away from disaster. Uh, it's important not to cross the line. And we have seen some pretty interesting, dumb things said by Christians, unfortunately, over the years. And we've seen some missteps. We've seen some people who thought they were saying the right thing and just was terrible. And some of these, of course, you can't even defend some of this stuff. And, and because uh, we, we live in an era, and here's the key, everything is amplified and everyone is outraged. So little things become big things. One comment, one word, all of a sudden will become something big. And of course, we live in an age of perpetual outrage. I, I heard yesterday Dr. Ben Carson uh, from the United States, uh, uh, who's, uh, I think he's the he's, uh, Secretary of Housing, I think, in, in the Trump administration. Wonderful man, wonderful Christian man. And he was just calling on people just to stop being outraged all the time. And it's true. It only takes one comment to, to, to create a media frenzy. It's sad we live in that world, but we do. So just be careful and identify the vulnerabilities of your organisation. Mm -hmm. So I just want to leave you with a word of encouragement. And that is um, Christianity is, is, a, is a great message. The church has a great message. The gospel is a message. It needs to be out there. We need to speak uh, it, it, culturally, we need to speak on a lot of things. Uh, tell your story. Tell your story. Tell the Christian story. But do it with wisdom. Be prepared. But let's not stay silent. Let's start to communicate regularly and get our message across. Thank you, Greg. I, I have no idea what how long time went on. I hope Thank I Thank you, Lyle. Uh, it's all good. If you can give me back the screen, that would be lovely. So I will do that. Yes, I'll stop the share right now. And I'll... Uh, there we go. Oh, beautiful. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to introduce John in the meantime. David, can you monitor those questions and, um, and edit them accordingly? I know we might, we've got a lot of questions coming through, but please let me introduce John Sanderman, who's the editor of Eternity News. Now, John is a highly respected uh, editor. He's um, uh, Eternity News is tied up with the Bible Society of Australia. I've known John for a number of years now, and I, John, without sounding gratuitous, I highly value your contribution to the public discourse on Christianity. So thank you very much for all your efforts in the past. So John, over to you, because now we've heard from a, um, a PR company, now we're going to hear from the media itself. So John, over to you. Thank you and good evening. Um, Greg, I... Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to your audience. Um, thank you, David, for your leadership of Family Voice. Let me reflect on one thing you've said, and that was, will the media come to the party? Well, I guess my perspective is it will not. And there is a very good reason for that. And I often say to people, you've got a choice. Uh, the Bible teaches us that 
things, the things of spiritual value are spiritually discerned. So if the media starts um, producing the sort of message that we want, it means one of two things. It means either the media has been converted or we've gone off message ourselves. So uh, the fact is the Bible is true. And the Bible understands that there is a group of people who have come into the light called Christians and Family Voice once upon the time was called Festival of Light. So you're familiar with light. Um, and there are people who have not come into the light. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that media in our country and many countries around the world, all countries, in fact, reflect is the fact that we have the children of light and the children of darkness, people who have been saved and people who are, have not been saved. And many of the deeper things that we are very concerned about, uh, our inner motivation as Christians, are in that part of uh, knowledge which comes to us through the Holy Spirit, comes to us because we are saved people. So we have to be realistic about the mainstream media. In fact, we've been talking about two different things tonight. We've been talking about two different audiences. Um, we've been talking about, if you like, the media that serves the whole of society. And we've been talking about organisations such as Family Voice, such as the people that Lyle Mercer ABD represents. Uh, and they, their stakeholders are not necessarily the whole of society. Um, at one point, uh, Lyle talked about mobilising 70,000 messages, or if you're um, ACL, a couple of hundred thousand messages. But this is a society of 25 million people. And I guess that's where I'm starting from, um, that Christians in this country, um, although I, I respect some of the stats that Lyle talked about, about the 51 or 52% of people who claim to be Christians, I think at heart, most of us in this seminar will think that the number of people though, uh, that are true Christians is less than that. Now, we don't get to work out how many people God has saved in Australia. We don't know that. But I suspect most of us think that it's quite likely to be less than half the population of the country. So in terms of our messages, perhaps there are three groups. There are the people who are rusted on, who are thoroughly in agreement with what wants to be said. Then there are the people who are thoroughly opposed. And there's a sort of a middle third. Now, one of the questions for Christians in America, and perhaps it applies here, is have we lost the middle third? So is society naturally inclined towards us or have we slipped away from that? Now, my perspective is that largely the middle third has moved away from us. Now, there are many things where the middle third is with traditional values. For example, the Australian Institute of Family Studies will, has surveyed whether people believe that um, people in relationships should be faithful to their partners. And that comes out about 97%. Take a different topic, take the topic of abortion, a, a topic of which Christians are highly motivated on, will campaign extensively on, but yet there is a pretty solid majority against the Christian point of view, which is very sad. But that's the reality of where the Christian pub public is. Now, I suspect in the United States, the problem really isn't who um, controls the Supreme Court and who has the number of judges that um, is required to overturn Roe v. Wade. But the real problem is that most Americans support abortion on demand. And we have the same problem with bells on in Australia. So there'll be some things where society still retains, uh, because God is their creator, some Christian echo, and there'll be some areas where they don't. And the media somehow sits in there as an interpreting device. Now, I spent 29 years at Fairfax, as uh, I think Greg knows. Um, and then I've spent 10 years producing a Christian publication. So I'm sort of still suffering from whiplash. 
You know, I have a, um, a background in um, traditional media and I have had this experience of working in faith media. And of course, they're very different. There are assumptions that you make um, as in eternity that uh, people on the side of salvation, that they believe that Jesus died for their sins. But for the majority of Australians, those are very weird concepts. The idea that um, God would send his son to die for um, our sins is a concept that naturally people do not readily accept. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit, it takes preachers, it takes all sorts of things for people to come into Christianity. So it seems to me that's the big reality about media. Um, yes, um, media will not necessarily <laughs> quickly accept the, uh, the gospel. And there are a lot of people in media who have heard the gospel. There, there would be um, more people when I worked at the Herald who were ex-Christians than Christians. There would be more people who'd grown up in evangelical or charismatic Christian families and had moved away from that than people who were still Christians. And even less than the people who were Christian would be the people who were um, um, prepared to be upfront and perhaps as foolish as I as being a very upfront Christian in the newsroom. Um, that's the reality of, of the media. Christians are in a minority. There are a lot of people who instinctively don't like us. And what's happened in the 10 years since I left Fairfax, or 12 years since I left Fairfax, there's been the um, Royal Commission into um, Institutional Response to Child Sexual Abuse, which obviously features many churches. There's been the gay marriage debate. It's been tough territory for the Christian message. Lyle is not about to become unemployed. Let's just simply say that. <laughs> Lyle, you've got security of employment much more than the rest of us, let me tell you. And uh, I think the, um, one of the things that struck me very early on in my um, time at the Herald is you, you could turn on your computer and you'd see a basket marked contacts and in that basket for every subject you could think of, um, feminists had supply experts. Um, Christians have never been that organized. I think there is a truth that Christians actually have made it difficult for the media to understand them. Even with our inbuilt disadvantages, we have not explained ourselves well. Um, we have, we are, organized into so many different churches. One of the things in eternity we don't do is use um, honorifics. So we don't say the reverend this or pastor that, simply because it's too difficult. Nobody, no, there are, if you think about the title Rev, there's four different ways of spelling. it, And then you've got to work out whether you put the the in front of it or not or whether you put the full stop at the end, or it's R-E-V apostrophe D or R-E-V, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Christianity actually is a minefield for journalists. And to be, to be a friend of a journalist and explain things simply and clearly is a wonderful thing to do. But I think the key thing we have to recognize is that we are a minority. But what sort of minority do we want to be? I think we should be a joyful minority. And that's the sort of thing we, we need to project. There is in the, the Australian psyche a stereotype of Christians as joyless and strict. And you can trace that back to the convict era. You can trace that back to uh, Norman Lindsay. Um, you can trace it back to Manning Clark. There are many sources of that viewpoint in Australian history and they, they are related. So we are swimming against an Australian tide. We are offshore and a rip is pushing us further out to sea. So we need to recognize that. We need to confront the myths. Um, so every little bit of work we can do to be seen as a joyful minority, to expect that 
yes, um, we go up against society and they don't give us the result we want. Um, on gay marriage, plebiscite goes the wrong way. On um, abortion votes around the various states in the last two years, there's been a whole series of votes. They've all gone the wrong way. Um, New South Wales is an interesting case where the outcome was more conservative than people were expecting. And maybe you could ask about that. I, I think that was a really interesting case example of, of some, some campaigning by certain parliamentarians who did a very good job. But I think we need to, resp we need to understand media. Uh, what Lyle said about the conflict paradigm is absolutely true. There's one other paradigm that's out there, and that's the celebrity paradigm. You know, and, and various people such as um, Scott Morrison or, or Brian Houston or Glenn Davies or whatever will get caught up in that paradigm. Um, in eternity, we're trying to do journalism without the conflict paradigm. We're trying to do journalism without the celebrity paradigm. Can I tell you, it's hard. It's really hard not to use those paradigms, but they are actually... Um, things we've got to be very careful about because uh, they tend to control everything if you, if you don't watch out. Um, I think uh, uh, Australia is a tough place to be a Christian journalist and to be a Christian communicator. Lyle has a reputation for being quite a tough guy. Why has he got that reputation? Because he has to be tough. It is a tough job to put out a Christian message. Now, I've got to say that I think the idea that you can control the message is something I, I would like to just push back perhaps a bit gently against what Lyle said. I don't think you can control the message these days. I don't think anybody can. I think social media is largely uncontrollable. Um, you will have people saying things about you that you don't like. Um, and that's, that's just the reality of it. But what you can do is try and infiltrate it as much as possible. And I think how you infiltrate it is really important. I think we need to be unbitter, unangry. We need to be seen to be gentle and loving people while putting out a contradiction to the mainstream message. I think I've probably said enough. Thank you, John. Um, very interested in what both Lyle and you have had to say, John. In particular, the analogy of the Reverend. I know I'm a, I'm a chaplain, John, as well, and I get called chappy, chapo, preacher. Um, so I'm used to be, being called all sorts of names. And um, Lyle, you mentioned something really interesting, which I resonated with, that uh, be prepared to defend. And of course, um, 1 Peter 3.15 comes to mind, be prepared to give an answer as an apologist. So let's go into question time. Now we've got a lot of questions. What I think we'll do is we'll try and answer as many as we can. Those that we can't, uh, I'll make a copy of and give a copy to John and Lyle and maybe you could answer them for me and I'll pass it on to those people that uh, ask the question. Um, David, could you kick off the first question for me, please? Yes, indeed. From Alton Bowen, a Facebook seems to be a minefield. Activists are trying to be offended by a faith statement. So how much at risk of legal action is a Christian statement on marriage or Christ being the only way to God? Perhaps we'll invite Lyle to respond to that. Oh, I don't think there's any risk of a legal action. Um, I mean, if you, you're allowed, a, you're allowed a voice. There's lots of things said on, on, on there's lots of things said on social media that's worse than that. Um, I, you're, you're still, you're still allowed in Australia to be able to have an opinion uh, and have a belief. So there's no, uh, as long as you're not defaming anyone, or as long as you're not um, uh, engaging in hate speech, uh, then you're, you're safe from legal action. However, you are going to get, you, you could well be criticised depending on what the what the forum you're in. Um, and, and I would just always say, well, what am I trying to achieve um, on Facebook? Am I, am I just trying to achieve an argument or am I actually, I'm actually genuinely, is there someone there that, you know, that genuinely, you know, wants to, 
to know this. It, it, every situation is individual, but again, I, I don't think that we should necessarily be be silent, um, because if if we don't talk about what we believe, then we've we've ceded the, the social media ground to proponents of 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 things that we don't believe in. So uh, it's it's one. And there's, while I'm answering that, there's another question here which is pretty similar. I'm just looking at these myself. Um, and uh, talking about uh, the individual listeners calling into Talkback Radio, and so if you don't mind, I could, I could, I'll merge that in. It's it's the same it's the same issue, and that is that yes, someone might say something dumb, but I, I come back to what's the alternative of 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 a voice? The alternative is silence, and if we if we say nothing, then the only voices anyone will hear. Uh, will be will be the anti-Christian voice, and as John was talking about the 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 third the the middle ground, and they will be more influenced the more the, the quieter we are. So when we're when we're talking about things, when we're out there actively, um, you know, proclaiming what we believe, then then you know it means that someone that's the way people hear the message, isn't it? I mean, that's the way evangelists work. Um, can I just say something too about the about the minority? And, I, and, and we are, what John was perfectly right, we are a minority. In fact, in Jesus' day, in the Bible, they're a minority too. We've always been a minority. But <laughs> keep in mind that we're a far greater, major, greater majority than a lot of the minorities that have a louder voice. So if you look at, if you look at for instance, the, the, uh, the voice of the LGBT community, I mean, they represent literally a couple of percent. Um, I mean, some people argue those figures, but census-wise, we're, we're talking about a you know, couple of percent or a few percent. Christians represent a far greater percent, but yet who's impacting social culture more and who has over the last few years? So I think that, that we have to keep that in mind. We might be a minority, but we're a, we're a, we're a big minority. You know, we're not a small minority and, and we just don't want to... We don't want to be completely silent and cede that ground. So in Facebook, I would say it, but just be be wise. And I just think we should avoid arguments. I mean, even the Bible says that. Avoid the arguments. You know, you don't need to you don't need to go and, and, and make enemies of people. Okay. Mm. Thank and you. Very, uh, sorry, Dave. Uh, yes, uh, ask a question of John, if yeah. I may. Uh, someone wants to know, uh, given the shrinking attention span of young people, do we need to keep... Mm. Sh sermons uh, as short as possible. <laughs> oh, mate, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I go to a Sydney Anglican church, so I've got to be very careful what I say about the <laughs> um, I, I think there is something to be said for visual content in sermons, and I think there is a growing number of particularly younger preachers who are incorporating visual culture because one the shift is not only about attention span it's also about a move away from words only to words and images and if you like some people talk about the Gutenberg interregnum in other words uh, 500 years since the printing press of concentration of words but before then there was a balance of words and images and we are moving back towards a culture of words and images. Thank you. John, that's interesting you mentioned that because some years ago, I, many years ago actually, I, I, I was doing my first preaching at a local church and I went to Fred Nile and I said to Fred, could you give me some advice on preaching? And Fred said, yes, not a problem, Greg. He said, have a great beginning, have a great ending and make the gap in between as short as possible. So that was the best advice I ever got from Fred Nile. Okay, David, another question, please. Yes, uh, from Peter Robinson about handling journalists if they're interviewing you, and they've already made up their minds what the story is going to be. So, how do we disrupt the chosen narrative of the journalist? Perhaps uh, Lyle, that one. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think um, there's one thing John said before that I'll, I'll just mention. He said you can't control the message. Um, in this day and age, and there, there's there is definitely some truth to that, but you can tr you, what you can you can't control the narrative, but you can control your message. Let me just try and put it that way. You you can't control what people say about you. You certainly can't control social media, but you can control what you say. 
and you can control the message that you're giving out and that as a consistent message there so there's a little bit of a little bit of a difference there and i guess the what i was meaning but but it's you know they're both both viewpoints are, are basically correct you know um in terms of the the interview yes some journalists will have uh the the story already done it really does depend on who it is it's, it's a lot of these questions are going to be difficult because every situation is diff different um in in the world i live in in, in pr uh every there, there are there's no there's no black and white um there's no formula um so so it depends on the situation whether you respond whether you don't respond whether you do the interview whether you don't do the interview i mean if it was a current affair who called and said look we've got a story and and it was three o'clock and we were running a story tonight we want to speak to you then um you know you could pretty well rest assured that um that the story is already done uh and that you won't get it going i hope hopefully there's no channel nine journalists listening in uh if there is i i love you um but uh but if it was a you know if it was the six o'clock news and they're wanting to do a story about you know an issue that is um, just something else you know and it's a pretty of a it's an issue that can go either way then they're probably not they're probably they don't probably haven't got the story they, in fact they want to talk to you so you can give them the story so there are some times where the journalists are just fishing they don't know in fact you know as as john said as i've mentioned journalists don't know they don't understand christianity so there are opportunities to educate them and we've done this many times you know they come in with an idea but but you explain to them and, and the story is really really good towards christianity that that can happen so my answer is that you, it really depends on the situation um there are times to there are times not to um and if you're uh, in terms of of I'd suggest anyone that thinks they're going to talk to the media needs to do some training, needs to do some media training as well, so that you know, you understand, you, you get to put, uh, you get to try and think about each situation, you learn the strategy behind it, but also you're not caught off guard when you're asked a difficult question. Mm -hmm. One more quick question, David, if we can. Yes. One more quick question. Yeah. Yep, one more. Uh, just a quick reflection on yeah. Lyle's comment there. It's amazing the number of times that Jesus did not answer questions. Or well, his Absolutely. reply uh, gave no answer whatsoever, but just baffled uh, his audience. So we don't have to answer every question, I'm sure. Well, he asked. He, he answered a lot of questions with a question, didn't he? <laughs> he did. That's right. And he, he refused to answer uh, certain questions as well. Yep. Um, so we'll have the last question from Daryl Budge, our family voice man in the West. Oh, I should also point out that. Uh, when we used to be called Festival of Light for a, for quite some time, we refused to speak to the media because they were messing us around so much. Uh, and then as time went on, they learned to respect us because they knew that we wouldn't speak to them unless they gave us a fair hearing. So that's one strategy. Uh, Daryl uh, raises the question about advertising exclusivity and readership size um, shrinking. Does that explain why the media, newspapers, TV, etc., are uh, targeting a smaller, emotionally invested, ideologically partisan customer who's willing to pay for the subscription. So perhaps we'll ask John that, and just to finish off the question, uh, having lost the advertising dollar to social media, is this why newspapers and TV stations are becoming more shrill? I think there's something to that. I think in the United States, we've seen a, a move towards a European style of media. European media has always been opinionated and have several newspapers, conservative and, and of the left. Um, the United States traditionally had what were called state newspapers, which were pretty neutral and bland, you know, Minneapolis Star Tribune or whatever. And now we've seen a shift towards um, more uh, politically um, oriented media, and perhaps Keith Rupert Murdoch is partly responsible for that, as well as the um, the economic factors that the questioner suggested. All right, well, look, gentlemen, thank you very much, Lyle, John, thank you very much. You are both highly regarded. Um, I, for one, value the work that you do. Uh, may I, on behalf of our board of directors, our supporters, uh, thank you so much for joining us and, and we look forward to your godly wisdom in the public arena. Um, I'll ask David to close in prayer for us and I'll leave you with a final screen. 
Uh, for all those that have attended, we will follow this up with a questionnaire. We've made a recording of the of the uh, webinar tonight, which you'll be able to review. And all the questions that were asked, I'll send to each of the panelists, and they can answer those at their uh, at their leisure. So thank you once again, David. Could you close in prayer for us? Yes, Our Father, we thank you for the rich challenge we've received tonight, the excellent input, much food for thought. And so we pray that you will quicken to us the truth, quicken to us the way forward. Give us your discernment, we pray. Help us not to fall into the trap of answering every question that every journalist or every atheist or agnostic might raise, but help us to understand the heart of the issue, to respond as Jesus did. Uh, and so we, we do pray for wisdom for the ministries that are represented, for Family Voice, and for all who are at the cutting edge, for all of our churches as they're trying to share the gospel of our Lord Jesus and all of the lifestyle implications that flow from his lordship, even though our culture is in such denial. So give wisdom to your churches, to their leaders especially, we ask, and boldness in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody. That's the end of our program. God bless and have a pleasant evening. Good thank night. You. Good night.